Good day, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today for the first part of the webinar, Personal Branding. My name is Mariana. I'm with Ivy Exec, and today we will discuss the benefits on how an authentic personal brand expands your options. And now I would like to tell you a little bit uh, more about our presenter, Rosemary Davis James. In 1998, Rosemary founded Miboso, a full-service brand agency that delivers authentic personal branding and authentic business branding services to clients around the globe. Blending her corporate and product branding expertise with experience gained serving thousands of personal branding clients, Rosemary has developed the most comprehensive, well-validated personal branding program in existence. Her agency work and leadership of advertising departments for multinational retail giants supported some of the world's best known brands. Today, she divides her time between supporting individual authentic personal branding clients and providing an external authentic brand resource to businesses. And with this, I would like to hand it over to Rosemary. Thank you very much. It's great to be here today. And uh, welcome, everybody. I hope uh, you're ready for a, a rock and roll session. We've got lots of uh, data to cover, and uh, I'm looking very much forward to hearing your questions. Um, as we go through, um, as Mariana said, please do ask your questions while they're top of mind, and we'll get to those in a period that we've outlined towards the uh, end of the presentation. So without further ado, um, let's just take a look at what we'll be covering in today's session. Um, we're going to take a look, first off, at the top-line brand benefits, the things you can expect your brand to deliver for you. We're going to take a look at four brand secrets, things that you may not realize that your brand delivers. I've got a few warnings, uh, things that you should not do unless you have a well-developed, authentic personal brand. Then we're going to take a look at typical client complaints. These are the types of things that when I get a call, someone says, look, I'm in this situation. Will branding help me? Um, I'm able to say yes or no. And, and what I'm going to go through are typical complaints uh, that I think really fit uh, people attending today's uh, webinar. We're going to take a look at a real client story because I always find that a terrific way to demonstrate the effectiveness of a brand and how the various working pieces um, do, do their thing. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what got me into personal branding way before anybody even knew what it was. There were all kinds of jokes about cattle branding and so on and so forth back then, which I'm very happy to say have died down today since there's much greater awareness. We're going to take a minute and compare branded versus unbranded individuals so you can see what you get when you do have a brand. And then we're going to take a look at the brand opportunity and contrast that with the opportunity cost. And again, this is a pro-con comparison. When you have a brand, these are the opportunities that open up. And when you don't, these are what not having a brand costs you. We're going to spend a few minutes taking a look at myths and misperceptions, which now that personal branding has become such a hot topic, they have burgeoned. There are so many more than there were before. We've gone from people not understanding what personal branding was and thinking it's something that gets stamped into the uh, rear quarters of a cow to people talking about all kinds of things that um, they are trying to link to branding that may or may not fit. Um, there's a lot of experts out there today, uh, personal branding experts, and we're going to take a look at what they're saying um, because oftentimes they do, th their points of view do conflict, and oftentimes even a single expert will contradict themselves. We're going to take a brief look at some of the more illogical branding practices and, and equip you with some logic so that you can discern these for yourselves. The same with speculative claims. And then we're going to get into the documented benefits, uh, the key points that each and every one of um, Mabosa's clients walks away with. And then I'm just going to do a, a summation of um, today's webinar and give you a bit of a preview of what's coming in part two. So without further ado, I've got a couple of polls that I would love Mariana to run. And mm -hmm. the purpose of these polls is to um, get a sense of where you're coming from so that I can tailor this presentation specifically to your needs. So I, I will hand it back to Mariana. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So the first question is, do the people who work with and report to you know who you are and what you stand for? Yes? No? Unsure. OK. Now we have the results. 52% said yes. 12% said no. 36 said unsure. 
Excellent. Okay. Well, I think we better roll into poll number two mm -hmm. just to take that a little bit further. Yes. So if we were to unmute someone in this webinar and it turns out it's you, can you articulate your brand clearly? I can or I cannot? Okay. 27% I can, 73% I can't. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that is pretty much what I expected because it's one thing to live a brand and, and feel that you are very well understood and that people really know what you stand for, but when it comes to articulating that and expressing your brand, explaining who you are and what you're one of and, and presenting your value proposition tends to be a bit of a different, different uh, scenario. So uh, that is exactly what I expected and I will use that to uh, set this up to really em empower and enable people to do that. Now, um, let's take a look for a few minutes at the top line brand benefits. Your authentic personal brand ensures that you're never going to feel put on the spot when you're asked a question, even like the questions I just presented. Who are you? What are you one of? Um, why should I choose you for you know this position, this assignment? Um, it, it's a question that can come up overtly or covertly, but oftentimes it's an important question and if you don't give a good answer, you're going to miss out on an opportunity or a promotion or whatever's at stake. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when you have a personal brand, you never feel put on the spot because you know exactly uh, what it is that you do get chosen for, you know what you're valued for, and um, you can express it clearly. Let's take a look at the second one. Um, when you have a personal brand, you can promote yourself masterfully so people seek you out. This is important because, and, and where it ties in is it's not only about you, it's about the people who want the value that you offer. You understand what their needs are, you understand the realms that they operate in. Uh, for example, if you are in um, in a medical type situation, there are ways that you speak about yourself that are different to if you were in, say, a sales situation. Um, it, it, you know, every, each organization has its own culture, its buzzwords, and when you know how that works, you can present yourself in ways that um, everyone who you're pre presenting yourself to finds very appealing and very suitable. For To go back to the example, in a sales situation, it's acceptable to be a little larger than life and a little over the top, but in a, a medical situation, it's not appreciated and it's looked down on. You have to stick to the facts and the facts will speak to themselves. So um, that's a little bit of what this benefit's about. <clears throat> Now this one, it talks about making a lasting impression in less than a minute. And let me clarify, that is a positive lasting impression. It's not, uh, of course it is possible to make the other kind, but when you do have an authentic personal brand, you know through research, through validation, uh, and through insight into yourself what it is that really stands out about you, what makes people comment about you even when you have no idea that um, the buzz is happening as you join a group or enter a room. And when you've got that awareness, you can leverage it and take it, make it even more powerful and intentionally make those lasting impressions. And it, that really continues with this benefit, becoming skillful and comfortable in the spotlight. When you have great insight into your audience, your, your target market, your audience, uh, and those are very marketer type words, but when you're employed, I consider your target market, your employer, your bosses, your peers, all the people that you interact with who count on you to provide your skills and your strengths and the value to the organization. When you understand what they expect of you and when you understand how you apply your strengths and skills to meet their needs, whenever you are called on to speak or present, whenever you're put in the spotlight, it really gives you a great strength of confidence. Okay, so now we're rolling into the four secrets. Um, this is something that when you read the secret, it's like, okay, sure. Uh, I would expect if I was branded that I would be seen as the obvious best choice, but um, here's where your personal brand gives you an inside track. Uh, there's always some research involved. Let's say you are 
presenting yourself as a, a candidate for a promotion. And there you've got a couple of rivals, but you want to be the obvious best choice. Um, by doing some homework, understanding the scenario, and then matching your identified strengths and skills and values and, and aspirations to uh, those of the job and the people who are responsible for hiring, you can make your stand, yourself stand out by being, um, in their eyes, the obvious best choice. And I've got to some uh, a story that I'm going to be sharing a little bit later on in this webinar that demonstrates how one of uh, my clients did exactly that. Your personal brand also uh, enables you to supercharge your success rate. Sure, that sounds like a buzzword, but I've seen it happen time and again with the people that I've worked with. Um, they've gone from uh, one stage in their career or one type of job to a real step up simply by getting very, very clear on who they are, what they want, and the value they can pr provide, and learning how to communicate that effectively to the people who uh, are in charge of making those decisions. When you express your expertise so convincingly, your talent and sincerity and commitment shine through, that makes people very comfortable choosing you. Um, they feel, you know how it is when you are buying a product or service. When the reviews of the product or service tally with the marketing messages that the uh, manufacturer puts out or the provider puts out and everything seems to hang together, it's very easy to be comfortable um, investing your money even if it's a, you know, a, a big ticket item. You're much more comfortable investing in it because there's, there, there are no, there's no room for doubt. Everything hangs together and that's one of the things that your authentic personal brand enables you to do as well is to express yourself and have nobody wondering, well, why would they say that or where do they get the expertise to you know, be able to determine that. It, it, it's very easy for people to accept you and that, it, it, that, that frankly is magic. Uh, the fourth secret and this actually comes as quite a surprise to most of the people I work with, is that your authentic personal brand enables you to identify and actively pursue your dreams. At the initial part of the branding process is really, uh, it, it involves a lot of self-inquiry. Uh, you look at your values, you look at your strengths, and in order to create future success, you really do examine in some depth successes you've had in the past, and you look at what was it about the situation, the people around you, the tasks you were asked to do that made you so successful. And once all of those elements have been identified and tied together, you really do have a, a success formula that you can use to, as I said before, supercharge and move forward uh, pursuing your goals and, and actively pursuing your dreams. And now these are Perhaps common sense, but I wanted to add in a few warnings. Um, don't even think of applying for a new position, raise, or promotion until you can clearly state your competitive advantage. It's, it's very competitive out there. I'm, that's not news. Everybody knows that. And if you don't have the ability to tell your prospective employers, uh, new bosses, people responsible for promoting or hiring you why they should choose you, they're going to choose the person who can't tell them. Um, it, this is because it's such a competitive market, you can pretty much bank on many of the people who are competing with you for the promotion or the role to have done the work and determined what their competitive advantage is. So it, it's, it's a key part to a personal brand and uh, it's something that is used to be a nice to have, uh, a real d distinct advantage, and now it's become absolute necessity. Second warning point, um, don't even think of applying for a new position raise or promotion until you know which strengths are your greatest assets and how to leverage them to get the responsibilities, the role, the remuneration and respect you want. Uh, again, this all falls out of the um, process, which we're going to speak much more about the mechanics, how personal brands work, are built, come together in part two of this webinar next in, in the next session. Um, and I'm not going to really go too much into that right now, but 
as I mentioned a few minutes ago, this, this deep introspective aspect of the process right at the very beginning, understanding which are your greatest strengths, how to leverage them, and what results they have delivered in the past um, enables you to really present a strong case for uh, the, the new position, raise, or promotion that you're seeking. And all of those other good things, the, the four R's, responsibility, role, re remuneration, and respect. This is something that it relates to the earlier benefit where we were talking about everything hanging together. Um, it's important to be able to express your story, to, to tell people how you came from where you were to where you are in a way that really does make sense to them. Um, it, there, there needs to be a common thread, um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be functional expertise. It just needs to be understandable to the listener as, OK, well, it makes sense that uh, you went from you know, having a degree in mathematics and uh, loving you know, the whole financial side of things to being fascinated by uh, technical analysis of uh, financial markets. You know, if, if you love history, because technical analysis has a lot in it about historical trends, and if you're a history buff and you also loved um, you know, reading up and becoming expert on how the world has changed over the last number of years, putting those two together and telling your story. It's like, well, I loved history and I was fascinated with, you know, how things were impacted during the Great Depression and during World Wars and, and you know, during other conflicts and uh, experiences that the nation has gone through. And you can make that a connection between uh, technical analysis, which, which looks at how world events impact financial markets, it, it gives people a good understanding as to why you are so passionate about your current um, position. And uh, it, it explains it to them in a way that they don't have any more questions about your credentials or credibility. Ah, this is interesting. You need to be able to express your unique, your unique appeal so that it shines through your online profiles and written documents just as strongly as when you present in person. Now, the point behind this is that most of us, as we work our way up the corporate ladder, um, progress in, in our professions, even as we go through uh, our education, we are taught to speak and write and present in certain ways. And these could be academic um, preferences. They could be uh, preferences that are specific to your uh, specific profession. But what happens when we just sort of launch into that type of speech or presentation, it, it, when it varies a lot from our typical speech, and often it does, it, it makes you come across as inauthentic. So. Um, What's it, what we do when we're working on a personal brand is we, we identify a brand voice. So it's like, OK, how do you sound and how do you speak when you come across naturally? And then we go through the unlearning process of, OK, well, when you were in academia, it made sense to speak and present like that because that was what re was required. And we unlearn anything that makes people sound stilted or artificial. And while working within the constraints of what's expected in their profession, we create a, a brand voice and a way of speaking and writing that makes, well, it ensures that the person comes across as genuine and natural. Because a genuine and natural speaker is has a much greater ability to engage their audience than someone who sounds stilted or scripted or uh, uncomfortable, because that's where a lot of stage fright and nerves comes from. People know they don't come across well. and then they get nervous, and that just compounds the problem, starts a vicious cycle. Now okay. we're at the point, oh, there we go. I was yeah, just gonna I believe it. Yeah. We, have, <laughs> yeah, we, we have, have another, another poll. poll. OK, so I'm just going to launch it, and here it is. An authentic personal brand produces tangible, measurable results like time saved, money saved, and money earned. This is a simple true-false question. OK, we have the results. 84% true, 16% false. 
Excellent. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, I, a lot of people call me up and um, inquire about branding and have questions about, you know, is there more to a brand than a social networking profile? It's like, absolutely, yes. Other people will ask, is there more to a brand than, you know, just a logo or, you know, something that I put on a business card? Absolutely, yes. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that most of the people on this call have already figured that out. So that's great. I'm going to get into the real client complaints, the, the few of them. There aren't 36. I'm not going to make you go through 36. But there's just a few that I've picked out. And uh, speak to how typically these cl client complaints, let me try that again, these client complaints are resolved. Now this one asks, how can I figure out where to put my effort to get the results I want? And that's actually pretty common, especially with people who have been uh, in a particular role or in a particular profession for quite some time. They've gotten used to the, the business cycle, the annual cycle. Certain months, certain things come up and um, they go with the flow and they try to do their best, but they're really looking for a way to stand out, um, especially in recent times where a lot of people who have asked this question, um, the urgency behind the question has been, I know that my department is uh, a candidate for some personnel cuts and I do not want to be the one getting cut so I, I really need to stand out. My performance has to be great and I need to produce the results that will keep me exactly where I am or move me forward. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and the personal branding process totally um, accommodates this request because again I'm, I'm, I'm starting to repeat myself a little bit but when you know what you're valued for, and we do a, a full 360 uh, assessment that pulls input from peers and bosses um, and, and various other people in your personal profes professional networks. When you understand what it is you're valued for, <clears throat> if you know why you were chosen in the first place, um, it's really easy, it becomes really easy to focus in on leveraging those strengths that produce the um, absolute best five-star results. So that one, that one seems like a dilemma when you're in it, but coming out the other side is actually quite easy. Another common question, huh, and I've been in the same boat myself. Uh, what I paid to, what I get paid to do, totally conflicts with my values and ideals. How can I find a job that doesn't? I'm sure some some of you have been in this situation too. You joined an organization that sounded terrific, had a very good reputation, had a moving and inspiring uh, corporate vision. But when you get on the inside, um, some of the things that you're asked to do are totally in conflict with what you believed the job was about and what you believed the organization was about. So the organization has, a, a, I, I would say, a, a brand. Um, and I guess that is the best word. It's got a culture. It's got a brand that actually is broken. Um, it, it does not. Uh, it does not align, and it is not consistent. So um, the way that this conflict is typically resolved through personal branding is by looking at your values and ideals, doing an analysis of uh, the values and ideals of the company you work with, companies you've worked with in the past, and possible prospective em employers, different companies that you've heard good things about and you're considering uh, moving to or seeking work at. Um, and when we complete the analysis process, obviously there are other factors to be taken into account. You want to be um, earning what you need to earn. Um, make sure that your position is available. Obviously, you're just doing a little research on your dream employer does not guarantee that they will have a job for you. But we do the research and, and we look at the best um, prospective employers and then put together a, a, a campaign that you can use to market yourself and your strengths. And um, out of the people I've worked with in the past, I, I would say this approach has had an 85% success rate at actually helping people land jobs where they can go to work and be totally comfortable that they're not going to be asked to um, lie to a, a, a supplier or uh, a customer or do anything that violates their ethics. 
I love my career, but it pays poorly. <laughs> I've run into a lot of clients like this. How can I increase my earnings without giving up what I love? Um, this is actually where branding gets quite creative. Um, it could be, I, I've worked with a lot of people who love to teach, and teaching is not something that pays very well. It's, it's, but it is, it is a calling. People who are teachers, it's kind of like engineers. Engineering, for many, is not a profession. It's a state of mind. It's a way of thinking. It's the same with teaching. It's, it's really a calling. It's how you're hardwired. So oftentimes, um, with people who are in professions like teachers, there are additional there, there are additional projects they can take on. There are, there are always niches or opportunities for them to uh, do a little bit extra and earn a little bit more. So they can stay principally focused in the work they love, but um, use their strengths in teaching and use their specific expertise uh, in whichever vertical within the teaching segment it is to um, boost their income, open up new opportunities, and sometimes when we've used this approach, it's even taken people from, you know, a comfortable but going nowhere position in, in teaching position to something where there are a lot of opportunities that op up, open up uh, on a regular basis, lots of um, scope for growth and change. Ah. The glass ceiling. I've reached the top of my career, and there's nowhere to go but down. Am I supposed to just hang in here for another 20 years until it's time to retire? Well, you could, but I think that would be a pretty dry 20 years. I've worked with a number of people who've um, had this concern. And it turns out that uh, even though you may think you're at the top of your career, there are opportunities to um, reach out either on the side or um, you know, create uh, an assortment of different roles which when you weave together become a full-time role and allow you to use your, your expertise, use your status, and um, keep your interest high and keep the challenge going because that's typically what it is when someone is in the situation is there's nothing that's challenging them anymore, so they're bored. Um, and they don't want to just you know, rest on their laurels. People who typically have the, the, um, the drive and ambition to get to the top, it doesn't go away just because you're at the top. So um, it, that's worked out um, very successfully in most cases. Ah, I've had a very successful career. But I have children now. I want a job that gives me the flexibility to be there for them. And I have no idea what that might be. I've worked with several people in this scenario, and it's, it's a challenge. Um, they've been, they've, they're ambitious people. They've succeeded. Um, they've got uh, good positions. They're well reputed. Uh, they're respected. But they don't you know, they know how hard they've worked to get where they are. And they want to take some time. They don't want to miss. Uh, their children's childhood. Uh, they want to be there for them. They want to enjoy them. And uh, actually, I worked with one woman who comes to mind who uh, was very successfully running um, a large fashion business. And she was doing very well, but she had a little girl who, when we were working together, had just turned six. And she said, you know, Rosemary, I, I don't want to be missing her um, her events at school now that she's in school. I want to be there for her recitals. I want to be there for school plays. I want to participate with other moms and, and you know, help out uh, when I can in school events. I want to be going on the, the school trips with them. And uh, so she actually went from a, a high-flying um, fashion uh, CEO to uh, a realtor. She ended up uh, taking a job as a, a realtor. She sent sells uh, high-end homes in a, a very ritzy part of town. And the hours work for her. She's uh, with her daughter a lot. And uh, she gets to meet interesting people. And uh, she's also got um, some staging companies she works with. So she's actually bringing, bringing together her fashion expertise, her business expertise, and, uh, and making the space in her life for what's important to her. Ah, uh, this question, since I took a leave of absence to care for my dying mom, the job that I used to love seems pointless, but I'm way too young to retire. How can I figure out what sort of work I'll find meaningful? This is 
something that I've dealt with, um, I won't say hundreds, but uh, definitely dozens of people who, for some reason, it uh, in, in a few cases it was uh, the death of a parent. Uh, in other cases, it could be an accident or you know, death of someone in the family or illness. Um, but something happens and it just changes your perspective. And, and the work that you were doing doesn't seem to be all that worthwhile. So there you are, um, typically mid-30s to mid-40s, uh, with, uh, you know, with a track record in a certain career, and all of a sudden you want to do something different. And what to, the, the person that comes to mind is uh, a research scientist. She had spent years working as a research scientist. She had uh, registered patents for, and done work for NASA, very, very well respected in her field. But after the death of her mother, um, it, it just seemed like, you know, I think she told me she felt like a hamster on a wheel. And it wasn't very fulfilling. So um, we did some research. You know, we went into her brand, lots of insight into herself, lots of soul searching. And um, this is going to sound bizarre, but what she's doing today very happily and very successfully is working as a psychic. And um, she it was fast. She used to develop artificial intelligence software, and she got fascinated with how the human brain works and neural networks. And um, it, it, it sounds totally crazy, but it's exactly what works for her, and uh, she's doing very well. And it, it, it worked in terms of switching careers into something that would not. Um, hold the fact that she didn't have a background in that subject specifically against her. We found a way to work in her, um, her, her physicist and scientific background so that she was welcomed into this new profession and uh, her credentials counted very much for her. Uh, this complaint is becoming more and more um, predominant. Uh, I'm one of the top professionals in my field, but my profession is changing. I'm expected to do tasks I dislike and do poorly, yet I want to continue producing quality work. How can I reposition myself and or change my employer's expectations? This complaint is probably the easiest one to handle with personal branding. Um, by determining what your strengths and your weaknesses are, we actually look at strengths and weaknesses as opposite ends of the same continuum. So what's your greatest strength on your best day can also be your greatest weakness on your worst day. So someone who's you know, got great drive and determination uh, may make them a fabulous salesperson. They, they never drop a lead. They pursue um, every piece of evidence, every, every need. And, and make sure that they meet it with a benefit. But that same drive and determination that makes them a great salesperson on their worst day can make them very um, dictatorial and domineering. It's, you know, it's my way or the highway. You know, I know how this is supposed to go. So when you do take a good close look at your strengths and weaknesses and look at them from that perspective, um, it's easy to come up with a short list and a way of presenting um, your findings to your employer um, and, and show them the benefits in freeing you up from doing tasks that you dislike and do poorly and let you focus your strengths on uh, what you can do really well and deliver great results in. Number 35, and I've, this is, again, this has been a very frequent um, complaint or question. Many customers have complimented my work and told me I should be in business for myself. I stayed employed for job security, but these days it seems that it's more secure to be self-employed. Um, but I'm stuck because I don't know how to sell myself for my expertise. Now this is uh, a, a concern expressed often by people who have been in the corporate world all their lives and not in a sales or marketing function. They have um, expertise in uh, accounting or um, operations or whatever their profession called for, um, but they've never had to uh, sell themselves or their expertise to a, a, a specific target market. The, the most selling they've ever done is pitching a concept or a project or an idea to their peers or their bosses, and um, that tends to be not, not enough equipment to go out there if you were to want to start a business. So. Uh, again, we go back to the drawing board. We look at their strengths. We look at their skills. 
Um, and also we get into the whole world of selling where you look at benefits. Um, what are people going to get from this product or service you want to start selling, like this business you want to get into? How is it going to benefit people? What needs will it fulfill? What problems will it s solve? And when they walk out of the branding experience, not only do they have the confidence that they can sell, they are also equipped with an extensive benefit list and you know they've had chance to practice with it uh, because testing is a key part of the branding process. So they've, they've got the benefits, they've tested them, and they are very comfortable going out there, um, working the benefits, and uh, getting the results that they want. Ah, and here we come up to a real client story. Uh, I wanted to use this as an example because she's gone through uh, a lot of the common concerns that um, new clients raise when they come to me. Danielle was, she, she is uh, an absolutely dedicated professional. She has the highest ethics, she has uh, an incredible work ethic, and I believe it took her 10 years to work her way up the corporate ladder uh, and working very hard, and, and she reached her goal, uh, which was to be the corporate VP. And at that point, she was at the top of her game. Um, unfortunately, the top of her game uh, concurred with the merger of her organization. It was bought out by another company. So she had been corporate VP for, I think, about six months when uh, her client, or sorry, her, her employer, uh, ceased to be em her employer and became a different company. Now, she was invited to take a literal mo lateral move and stay where she was, um, but she had another opportunity as well because there were a number of executives that um, being given the choice between lateral moves and um, exit packages had decided to take their exit packages and come together and form a new business. And Danielle was invited to do that. So they forged ahead. They created uh, actually a competitive business to the one that had employed them, and it did extremely well. It went from strength to strength. They got funding. Um, they were well received by their target market. They were, you know, fully booked. They had all the business they could handle, and then it, the time passed, and we are in the fall of 2008. Um, the business, unfortunately did not make it, uh, it, and it was not through no fault of its own. One of its funders had been impacted by the uh, financial meltdown and withdrew their funding. So uh, Danielle found herself uh, in her 40s, uh, unemployed, uh, with a family depending on her. She was the sole income earner, and her family members had uh, some health issues that had uh, distinctive criteria attached to them. They, uh, because of their health issues, they needed to stay in uh, a dry climate uh, in the southwestern states. So um, she came to me and we put together uh, an authentic personal brand for her um, that would help her overcome all of these hurdles because, you know, she was unemployed like most Americans, her investments had tanked, and her home was worth a fraction of its former value. So she needed to, she needed to take some action and take it quickly. And this is, that's an extreme example. But most people, when they do uh, begin developing an authentic personal brand, they need to, they need something to change. They need different results. They, they, they want different outcomes. They don't want to just keep working and generating the same results. They, they want something else. So we put together a, a brand for Dan Danielle. We determined her strengths. We looked at her value. We looked at what made her unique and different. We put together her um, value proposition, came up with a list of benefits uh, that she could use to sell prospective employers on the, her talents and skills. And she took herself out there. And her, she credits her personal brand with helping her find the perfect job. Um, and as she said, when you build a brand and understand who you are, it puts you in the power position, which is where you want to be. Um, she was able to use what she'd uncovered through the branding process to uh, determine which employers she wanted to approach. And she got three offers from all three that she had approached. And then she 
used her personal brand to go a, a little bit further after her phone interviews with HR and the C-level executive who was in charge of hiring her, she put together a PowerPoint presentation that was based on the needs of the individual, the three individual companies. She had asked a lot of questions during her interviews and um, based on what she'd learned, um, these PowerPoint presentations spelled out what she would accomplish and what projects she would work on 30 days after being hired, 60 days after being hired, and 90 days after being hired. So what she provided these prospective employers with uh, told them uh, how she would provide them with the most impact and the greatest results based on her strengths in those three different time windows. So, uh, and again, I'll quote her. She said, when you have the confidence and understand what you stand for, it's easy to meet your objectives. And that was her solution. I was a little behind there. So, um, did we have a, a, a poll scheduled, Mariana? Mm -hmm. for we have. Period? Yeah. Here's another one. Okay. Why don't you go ahead? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An authentic personal brand can increase your earnings this year by $1,000, $10,000, plus. Okay. I think... Everyone has voted. 57% said $10,000, so we have 0% for $1,000. 25% said $100,000, and 80% said $150 plus. Wow, I'm impressed. That's terrific. Well, they, they're, they're all correct. It, it very much depends on what you're earning and what your earning potential is. But uh, executives that have been in the upper echelons have definitely hit the higher numbers, and people who are um, not earning quite so much have hit the lower numbers, but you're right, nobody earned as little. No, no one's brand earned as little as $1,000. So, Very good. We have an awesome group on with us today. Thank you. Now, I wanted to give you a little bit about my background. Uh, Mariana did give, me, give you the, the, the short version, the um, professional bio version, but I, I wanted to just tell you a little bit what got me into the whole personal branding niche. Now, I, as you see on the screen, I've got a few attributes um, outlined, and I did that purposely because a lot of people will have descriptive words such as I've used, and you know, I call them word strings. They will string them together and think that's their brand. It's not a brand, and I know you guys are a savvy group. You won't be fooled by that, but I put that out there. Those are certain attributes of mine, but by no means are those my brand. So um, let me tell you my story. As Mariana noted right up front, um, I have spent 20 years in progressive roles in ad agencies and leading corporate marketing and communications teams and working with some of the best known brands in the world. Um, and after that experience, I founded uh, my own brand agency, Maboso, back in 1998. Because in my corporate and agency days, I met a lot of people who just weren't happy with their lives. They complained about their jobs, their bosses, their commutes, their lack of time to do what they really loved. And what comes to mind is there was a fellow I worked with uh, in one of the corporations, and he was a natural comedian. He, when he let loose with uh, one of his, I don't even know what to call it, but he, he, he could sit in a chair and just run off a couple of lines and everybody around him, uh, myself included, would just, you know, our ribs would hurt. We would get laughing so hard. So he spent his days crunching data and really what he should have done is cast off his corporate shackles and take to the comedy club stage. And he knew it, but he just wanted to play it safe. So I met a number of people like that. And that really piqued my interest in applying branding processes to people because when you brand a product like Coke or a business like Starbucks, what happens is that a brand personality is invented. Uh, it gets made up, so specific values, preferences, and strengths that have proven appeal to an intended target market are woven together and assigned to the brand. Now, I believe that branding held the key to connecting people's strengths and skills to the roles that would fulfill them and the target markets that wanted them. After all, it works for laundry soap and toilet paper. Why not people? So that's exactly what I did. 
And the benefit for me is that we as people come preloaded with personalities, values, preferences, strengths, and, and so much more. So I devised a way of applying the branding processes to leverage your real personality, your values, preferences, and strengths, packaging them up in a way that's totally genuine and hugely attractive to your target market. And as you know, and you've been on the call, I call it your authentic personal brand. Um, and I do that because it looks like you, it sounds like you, it's recognizable as you, and it attracts the people and opportunities that want and need the benefit, benefits and value you deliver. Now, since 1998, I've enabled thousands of individuals to develop the authentic personal brands that increase both their professional success and their personal satisfaction, saving them time and money, increasing their earnings. And the reporting scale that I developed gives my clients the ability to accurately measure and firmly quantify the tangible results that their personal brands deliver. And since a lot of the people I work with are um, senior executives and business owners, that quantification process is very, very important. Now, one corporate executive calculated that her personal brand drives over $500,000 a year in savings and earnings for her employer, but they don't get all the benefits. This VP credited her brand with earning her over $182,000 last year, and this is a benefit that will repeat next year and the year after that into the foreseeable future. Now, compounded earnings and savings over time make this executive's personal brand a highly productive investment. And I'm so committed to educating people on the power of authentic personal branding. I've presented to live executive audiences all over the world, um, at the University of Chicago, at Bryn Mawr, in Quebec City, Toronto, Johannesburg, Cape Town, South Africa, in Marlowe, England, just outside London, in New York, Philadelphia, and Phoenix. So it's a good thing I like traveling. In recent years, I've also included virtual presentations through the Guru Nation, the corporate state, and here today at Ivy Exec, to name a few. So that's a bit about my background and what got me into personal branding the year before this topic even made headlines with the publication of Tom Peters' iconic book, The Brand U50. So that's a little bit about me and what got me into it. I just saw so many people so many talented people who were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it was making them very, very unhappy. So let's compare individuals without personal brands to individuals with successful personal brands. Um, typically, what's different is that the people with personal brands have clarity, they have focus, um, they are satisfied, and they have functional success. And what I mean by that is they're doing what they do well. They're using their strengths um, and their skills. And functional success uh, leads to financial success, which leads to lifestyle satisfaction, which could be redefined as happiness. Uh, individuals that don't have personal brands, a lot of times they're, they feel a little bit lost. They, they know they're not in they know they're not where they should be, but they don't know where they should be. So they know they're not there, but they, they can't define what's missing or what's wrong or, or where they need to go. And that's what the whole um, branding process was developed to do. Now, what's on the table for those seeking authentic personal and business lives through a personal brand? Um, gosh, it's such a big question. Um, it's, we it's, do have a poll for 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 this one. Let's go there. Let's let's go there first. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here it is. What do people who have successful personal brands say is the greatest benefit an authentic personal brand delivers? The rock solid confidence that deep personal insight deliver, increased income, increased efficiency, a fast track to goal achievement, personal satisfaction. Okay, so I think we're done. 54% the rock solid confidence, 7% mm -hmm. increased income, 4% increased efficiency, 11% a fast track to goal achievement, and 25% personal satisfaction. I say we've got a great group today. That's exactly <laughs> the order that I would put them in, and, and that's the order that my clients report in. It's you know just understanding what makes you tick and where you fit is so, so, so important. And it gives you the confidence and the power to really manage your life in the way that, 
in the way that you wish that fits your your dreams and your goals. So, um, yeah, that was that was terrific. I'm 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 preaching to the choir. It seems. <laughs> so um, let me just use a couple of examples um, that really re maybe which is one because we're no oh, maybe I won't maybe I'll just carry on. So I think people have got that already. So I'm just wanting to watch the time. So on the flip side of the opportunity, uh, the opportunity cost. So, you know, again here we've got lost time versus time gained. So uh, lost time is when you're unbranded and you're not focused. Time gained is what you get as a result of being focused through branding. Um, you've got costs versus savings, lost earnings versus increased earnings, frustration versus fulfillment, being average or mediocre versus being accomplished, being unknown versus well-known, and passed over versus sought out. I'm just going to touch lightly on myths and misperceptions because this group sounds so savvy, I, I think you're not getting fooled by anyone. Um, a lot of people have this myth in mind that a logo is a brand. And actually, it, it gets perpetuated by all kinds of businesses out there, even to um, reality TV. I don't know if anybody uh, is is a follower of the Celebrity Apprentice, but I've seen a couple of episodes, and it seems that whenever they have a task that involves a retail store, or or you know selling something, and most of them do, uh, the few I've seen is you know they will talk about a retail store's sign, uh, just a sign on the wall of the store as the store's branding. They will talk about the um, the, the segment of footage on a TV commercial where the product. Uh, and you know, product packaging and logo pops up as its branding. That is just such a small piece of what a brand is. And I actually wrote an article on that at examiner.com, which you'll see on the screen if you want to uh, have some fun. And you know, when is a logo a brand? The answer is it's never a brand. But I had some fun explaining that. So feel free to explore. Ah, another myth is that a brand is something that's um, a website. Again, and a lot of this this myth has been perpetuated by people, obviously, selling um, personal websites as brands. Um, it, it, an online brand it is just an aspect of a full personal brand. It's not an entity uh, of itself any more than a logo is a brand. So uh, sort of cover that one off. Now, the conflict in expert rhetoric, and I say expert, people who call themselves personal brand experts, um, there's a big difference between self-promoter and brand expert, and I was doing some research for a webinar that I led uh, in December called The Truth About Personal Branding, and it seems that if you if you analyze what you're reading carefully, and, I, and from what I'm hearing, this group is very competent and, and capable of doing that, and if they are just, you know, if they're just putting up an outrageous claim in order to grab headlines and, and you know, get eyeballs onto their blog or article, then, you know, it can be discarded. A brand expert, they will put forth a rational argument. It, they won't have any fuzzy logic or um, any of that sort of thing in there. So if you're look, when you look at the experts and what they're saying, just subject it to logical scrutiny and uh, you'll be, it'll be clear who, who is the true expert and who's the pretender. Uh, and again, this just backs up when there's a lot of strutting and bribery, you know, bribery being, you know, if you follow my suggestions, you'll get this or you'll get that or you'll be a millionaire in two months. You know, obviously that's not very believable. Um, branding practices that are consistently tested and validated and repeatable, um, those are, that's where the value lies. Again, more of the same. Big headline claims, small print corrections. I, I saw them ad nauseum as I was doing my research. Um, if you see someone out there that's an expert that's making consistent claims, um, the value is consistent, their delivery is consistent, you, you're probably in pretty good, pretty good hands. Um, if you would like to you know, get even more information about what uh, the people I've worked with have gained through branding, there is a, a, a URL there, mboso.com slash ravereviews.html. There's all kinds of people there talking about what uh, personal branding has done for them. And now it's time to field some questions. And I'm excited to hear what you've asked.
Mm -hmm. That we have uh, many, many interesting questions. Here's the first one. Um, I'm an American expat working for overseas companies in the MENA region. I work for foreign companies or even foreign governments. How do I manage my brand on an international stage across these diverse cultures? That is a great question. And I've actually lived and worked all over the world as well, so I can relate to it. Um, I think it's really important, like even though you need to be, you know, you're in different cultures and it, it, it can be very different. And I know what the differences are even across English-speaking countries. They're, they're huge. So when you're really in very different cultures, what you can be known for, what your brand can be known for is consistent delivery of specific values. And that translates through every culture. Um, if they know they can count on you to deliver specific um, skills or strengths or, or you know, results. Um, you can become known for, you know, consistent delivery on time, um, you know, for keeping your word, for being trustworthy. Um, and those things are, are really well respected across all nationalities. Okay, perfect. Here's the next one. How can we position our strong brand in front of prospective employers when we're currently not handling a major big role that justifies my caliber? I'm sorry, a major big, I didn't... A big role that justifies uh, the caliber. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, how can we position our strong brand in front of prospective mm -hmm. employers when we're currently not handling a major big role that can justify. Okay so, you know. okay, so it sounds like there's a strong brand, but there's some problems behind the scenes mm -hmm. that are known of. Um, the, the best way to go at that, or what I would suggest, is that um, if there is that great strength, the historical strength, there's a good track record um, that the current situation can be positioned as, you know, one of those challenges that every strong brand comes face to face with, uh, you know, now and then. And, uh, you know, look at it from the perspective of, you know, we've got the strength we've got because we've, we've been faced with these challenges before, we've overcome them before. And, you know, the situation, you know, it's current, so it's fresh and we're all aware of it, but it will also be overcome through our, our core strength. Mm -hmm. We have a, a very interesting comment from, from one of our attendees, and, and this is um, going to be you know, not very short one, but um, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, the attendee said that he believes that, the, that your question was too simple during the presentation, and he wants to ask what you think about his understanding. Um, according okay. to his opinion, personal brand uh, in his business environment is more than delivering tangible results. The brand actually is the congruency of, number one, being what you are claimed to be, be authentic. Number two, only promising benefits that you actually can deliver, actually be honest. And number three, delivering the tangible results you promise, be reliable. The higher the congruency of these three ingredients, the better, stronger your personal brand is. Yeah. Absolutely. That's absolutely what living the brand is, and what I've been speaking about is demonstrating the brand. Because a lot of times people will think they have a brand because they, you know, they stick to their values, they are reliable, they are honest. But then, you know, perhaps they're in a situation like my my client uh, Danielle, and they're suddenly unemployed and they never expected to be. They need to actually be able to express and communicate their brand to people that have never met them before and uh, do it in such a way that they do gain their trust uh, quickly and their confidence quickly and um, basically they are extremely believable. So that, that participant, you're absolutely bang on. There is much more to it than just communication and benefits. But when, when it comes to demonstrating a brand, that is the best way to be able to um, you know, really attach some tan tangible outcomes to what a brand can do. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. That's Great, great point to put in. Perfect. I, I believe we have time for one more question, and then we should probably wrap up. Um, okay. I am an immigrant in Canada. 
very qualified with excellent command on English. However, my name seems like a barrier in getting calls. Can personal branding address this issue? Absolutely. Absolutely, especially in Canada where um, there is a very diverse um, population that is growing more diverse by the day. So uh, the, the name barrier can totally be overcome by uh, a clear demonstration of understanding of prospective employers' needs and documented uh, history of being able to solve them or an ability to present your strengths and skills in such a way that they are convinced that you know, if they were to choose you and be, by applying your skills and strengths, you would be a definite asset to the organization. Perfect. Thanks so much. Okay, I think okay. we've covered it all for, for today. Uh, Rosemary, okay. I'd like to thank you for the great presentation. I'm sure all our attendees enjoyed it. Um, I just want to mention that uh, we will definitely provide uh, recording of the presentation as well as the slide deck and I will let you do the the, the, the closing with you know a few words okay, about great. Proposo. Excellent, thank you. Well we do have a special offer. I'm, I'm not going to roll it all out today. I'm not going to take time for that but if you'd like to go to the website maboso.com slash ivyexec you will see all the details there. We're putting a very special offer out for you and um, I think we're out of time for wrap up but we also have a free gift it's a podcast that uh, outlines seven mistakes people make when starting to craft authentic personal brands. And again, you can go to that same URL and uh, pick that up. And I hope you will join us next time because we've been speaking today more about the what, more about the benefits of personal brands. And as the participant uh, whose question Mariana um, passed on to me, you're absolutely correct. Where I love to dwell is in the how of branding, you know, how it comes together, the mechanics, what are the moving pieces, how do they mesh together to produce the, the benefits that we spoke of today, and that's what we're going to be focusing on in part two um, down the road on March 6th at 12 noon. So I hope you will all come back and join us again. Thanks so much, Rosemary. I hope you'll attend the part two, um, all of you attendees, and that we'll have even more registrants. Please feel free to prepare some questions up front. That's something we can do as well. Um, and then we can have uh, a little bit extra time for Q&A sessions because I believe there are a lot more questions to, 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 to come in during the, the, the second part of the personal branding presentation. Thank you all Absolutely. again. Absolutely. I'll look forward to that. Thank you very much. <laughs> have a great day. Bye-bye.